Prolexigimab used to be known as ESBA 1008 and then RTH 258. It's a special molecule. It's the first a single chain antibody fragment that has ever been made uh, and uh, used uh, in human beings, let alone the eye or the retina. Uh, it's very small. It's only 26 kilodalton large. And the idea behind a single chain antibody fragment is really simple. It's actually the holy grail of medicine and it has been tried uh, to be made for a long time, but it's not an easy thing to make. It's actually quite difficult because of aggregation issues. And the idea behind that is that if you look at an antibody, it looks like a Y. The tips of the Y is where the antibody is actually active in regards to the ligand. That's where the binding occurs. That's where the business end is. And the uh, goal has always been to use only the active sites because the rest of them end up being more structural and more stabilization issues. So to just use the binding sites, combine them together and have what would be the holy grail of drugs, which is a, a single a chain antibody fragment. Again, that hasn't been possible until now. So the idea behind this is that it's a very small compound and once it's administered either by injection in this case or possibly in a delivery system in the future, hopefully, there will be a much larger molar concentration, a much larger amount that will go to the target much faster, penetrate better, and hopefully last longer. Um, that's the goal of having a single chain antibody fragment, and broxizumab is the very first molecule uh, that has ever been used in human and manufactured uh, to be uh, one that would hopefully be effective and in trials, and that's why this molecule is so unique and special. So when broloxizumab was manufactured, it was then to be used in humans, and there are two studies that I'd like to talk about. The first is a phase one study called CSEE, -E, and the second is a phase two study, a very important phase two study called Osprey. A C was a first in man study. Uh, this was a single in injection dose escalation study where various doses of broloxizumab was used. And the primary endpoint was a reduction in central subfield thickness. And that was chosen as a primary endpoint because it was the most objective measurement. What was seen was that the primary endpoint was achieved and importantly, there was a signal that this drug may have an effect on efficacy, but more importantly at this time, and probably more convincingly, on durability. Um, there were no safety signals at all. So in many ways, the goals of a phase one study, particularly a first-in-man study, were accomplished, which is to show an excellent safety profile, and the second is to show a biological signal. From that point on, broloxizumab proceeded on to a phase two study, which was called Osprey. And Osprey was an interesting study because we wanted to see if we could actually see that durability signal. So there was a phase that was a head-to-head -head comparison at every eight-week treatment with a Flibercet that lasted for a pre-specified time. That was 36 weeks. And then there was an extension thereafter uh, where all patients, and this is very important, all patients on broloxizumab 6 milligrams were extended to Q12 weeks. Um, what was seen was that in the matched phase, uh, the, there was non-inferiority that was reached in terms of the visual acuity, but the anatomic um, parameters, the OCT, appeared to be better, appeared to be superior. In the maintenance phase, the same the same results were continued. And this was done with fewer injections with broloxizumab versus the Flibercet. It was very important to see that even with fewer injections, broloxizumab maintained visual acuity and actually improved the anatomy in comparison to a Flibercet. This was the genesis of the phase three Hawk and Harrier studies.
The Hawk and Harrier trials are phase three registration trials for broloxizumab. The primary endpoint was at week 48, and the study end uh, was at week 96. So if you look at the design of the study, there are two important phases that must be understood. The first phase is a matched phase up to week 16, and then a maintenance phase to study end. In the matched phase, Broloxizumab 6 milligrams and 3 milligram were given head-to-head -head versus a Fliberset. Thereafter, in the maintenance phase, uh, patients were extended as appropriate. What was also in this study were disease activity assessments starting at week 16. So, in a pre-specified fashion, disease activity assessment was done at week 16 and then on a regular basis thereafter until the end of the study. It is very important to realize that if disease activity was seen, the patient could be adjusted only one way, could only be adjusted to Q eight-week dosing. So there was no opportunity for a patient to come back up to Q 12-week dosing for the entirety of the study. So what were the results? Well, non-inferiority versus a Fliberset was achieved at the matched phase, which is Q16, which is, which is week 16. Non-inferiority was also achieved at week 48, which is the primary endpoint, and non-inferiority in terms of visual acuity was maintained uh, at the end of the study. It's important to understand that this was achieved whilst over 75% of patients who are on a Q12 week dosing regimen at at the primary endpoint, which was at week 48, were able to be maintained on that same Q12 week interval for the remainder of the study. Uh, again, the predictability of the disease activity assessment was very high. Uh, in general, uh, as I say, almost 80% uh, if patients were on Q12 week dosing at week 48. So that was the visual acuity outcome and that was the predictability outcome. In my opinion, what was most important was the anatomic superiority that was seen. So let's go back to the matched phase. At week 16, in the matched phase, in every parameter that was considered by OCT, broloxizumab was superior. So if we look at patients with intraretinal fluid and or subretinal fluid, and if we look at patients uh, with sub-RPE fluid, broloxizumab was superior at week 16, the matched phase, as well as week 48, the primary endpoint, as well as the end of the study. If we look at patients who were without fluid at week 16, 48, or at the end of the study, in all of these, again, broloxizumab was superior to a Fliberset. So at the end of the day, what was most important in terms of efficacy to me in this non-inferiority study is that there was anatomic superiority that broloxizumab had at all phases of the study in every anatomic parameter that was studied. The safety profile of broloxizumab uh, was very good and it was no different than the other anti-VEGFA drugs uh, that we've seen. So there was no issue with the safety profile. So again, the Hawk and Harrier registration trials uh, were successful in meeting the primary endpoint at week 48. That uh, primary endpoint in terms of visual acuity was maintained to the end of the study. There was anatomic superiority that was seen at week 48, the primary endpoint that was maintained till the end of the study. The most important part about this, these studies, Hawk and Harrier, to me are the fact that broloxizumab appears to be anatomically superior on every count to a Fliberset. I consider the Hawk and Harrier trials for broloxizumab to be a success, and I'm sure that there will be a lot more post hoc data analysis that will be done that will give us a lot better understanding of how this drug will be used. I also look forward to further post-marketing trials or phase four trials that will be ongoing, particularly trials that will look at things such as time to dry and possible superiority in terms of visual acuity, as well as some switch studies. Also very importantly, 
I look forward to brilocizumab being studied in other chronic diseases. For instance, uh, there are trials that are just started for diabetic macular edema and diabetic retinopathy, uh, trials uh, such as Kite and Kestrel. Um, I look forward to possibly having other trials also in branch retinal vein occlusion and central ret retinal vein occlusion. So at the end of the day, I think what we have is a more efficient anti-VEGFA. And I look forward to studying this drug in a number of chronic diseases that are very important to our patients. The most important finding in Hawk and Harrier, in my opinion, was the objective measure of the OCT. Because this is an objective measure, and also because that's how we treat our patients. That's the biomarker that we use to treat our patients, either extend their treatment interval, treat them early or treat them more intensively or not. And in every single OCT parameter, brilocizumab was superior. So the question is, when this drug comes to market, how will we use this drug? Well, what I would say is that at the end of the day, we have a validated target in VEGFA. We know it's a validated target. We've known that for more than two decades. And what we have with brolocizumab, given the results of the Hawk and Harrier trials, is that we have a more efficient drug, a more effective drug against that validated target. So what I think we will do is, as soon as we get this drug in our hands, the first thing that we will likely do is to use this drug in patients that we have, and there are a number of them that still have fluid despite numerous injections of our current medications such as Aflibercet or Ranibizumab or Bevacizumab. I think those are the patients that we will try this drug on first. And I think we will also try it on patients that are treatment naive. I also think that we'll try it on patients that are particularly treatment resistance, for instance, with sub-RPE fluid, et cetera. So I do think that once we get more comfortable with this drug and see that it is a more effective way of suppressing VEGFA, I do think that this drug will be our primary source of suppressing VEGFA.